first of all, um, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, so this talk is about, about um, a project that involves uh, using training objectives for neural networks uh, derived from pack-based bounds. It is a very cool interesting project. Um, I would like to start by saying uh, by acknowledging my collaborators in this project. Uh, very happy to have, you know, a very excited, a very exciting group of uh, collaborators. Uh, the success of this project owes a lot to their involvement. And I want to thank also uh, John and Chava for their support, for supporting my career. And uh, a little bit of uh, management of expectations before we move on. Um, so, this talk is going to have five main parts. So first I'm going to start by like motivating what was the background, how this project got started. And uh, then I'm going to talk about like neural networks in the classical setting. That's the setting in which the output of uh, training is a fixed setting of the neural network weights. And then I'm going to move on to, uh, let's call it the probabilistic neural network setting where the weights are randomized. So the output of learning is um, rather than a fixed setting of weights, is going to be a distribution over weights. And then I'm going to give just like a couple of highlights of the experimental results that, that we obtained when training probabilistic neural networks by minimizing pack-based bounds. And, uh, and then I'm going to wrap up with some conclusions. So I think what I would like to, to do regarding questions is more or less at the end of each of these five blocks, well, or the first four beginning blocks, uh, I'm going to stop quickly to ask if there are any questions regarding that part and, uh, and uh, address them there. Otherwise, like time for discussion and more questions will be at the end of the talk. I hope that sounds good. And uh, oh, one last thing to mention, by the way, I've been working at UCL for like two and a half years now, I think. And I have had opportunities to present my work um, at various places. Uh, this is actually the first time I'm talking at UCL. So for me, this is actually a very exciting opportunity as well, because I'm talking at home and uh, I'm very happy. I'm very happy about the opportunity to talk, to talk here. All right, moving on. So what motivated this project? So first of all, I want to mention this paper and weight uncertainty in neural networks. This was, this was a paper that, uh, uh, experimented with the approach of learning a probability distribution over network weights. So they learned what, what we're calling here a probabilistic neural network. Uh, the training objective that they used was derived uh, from like a Bayesian learning approach. So they looked like at the variational base, uh, variational base approach. So they parameterized a family of distributions and then they were aiming for finding one of those distributions that minimizes the KL divergence uh, to the Bayesian posterior. And uh, if you unwrap that KL divergence, then you, you get a function that looks more or less like the sum of a data dependent term, that's the negative log likelihood, and then a KL of the approximate posterior to the prior term. Um, so that's what is usually called the evidence lower bound or the elbow, and, uh, and then they modified a little bit this training objective in order to have something that is computable. And uh, they had some interesting results in the experiments. What happened there is that um, they demonstrated in experiments that weight randomization is competitive with, um, with the state of the art test accuracy of like uh, fixed setting of the weights of classical neural, neural networks. And also some ideas that it seems that uh, that this is introducing regularization along the way. So that was quite exciting. And uh, they named their algorithm base by backprop. They called it beam Bayesian by backpropagation. Well, beam Bayesian because you know the training objective was derived uh, from a Bayesian learning approach. And what they did in the end is in order to uh, optimize this function, they they uh, optimized over the parameters, of course, and then they used back propagation. So uh, updating the parameters um, actually reduces the gradients that are calculated by back propagation, and that's that's what gives the name to this to this algorithm. So another 
work that we took motivation from was this paper, <clears throat> a different set of people, a different approach. And uh, what happened is in, in this paper is um, they presented this pack base bound. Pack base bounds are bounds on the on the expected um, on the expected true error of a randomized classifier, and they are in terms of the expected empirical error and a KL term. But uh, what I want to highlight, I mean, without going into the details of what makes of the terms that make up this this pack base bound, what I want to highlight is the similarity of the upper bound. Uh, with the variational base training objective with the evidence lower bound. So there is a data dependent empirical term, and then there is a KL divergence uh, between, you know, an approximating distribution and a prior distribution kind of term. Uh, and one other, one other ingredient in this bound that made it interesting is that this bound holds uniformly for all values of a parameter in an interval. So that makes it that optimizing over that parameter is, is kind of like uh, comes for free. I'm going to give uh, more details about that when I talk in more details about back based bounds. Uh, so that was another of the, of the, of the motivations for this work. And uh, okay, one, one I, I guess I already mentioned it. So there is an extra parameter that can be optimized besides the parameter that defines the approximating distributions. There is an extra parameter that can be optimized, and then they play this alternative optimization. You know, one step updating one parameter, one step updating the other parameter, and whatnot. And uh, of course, since we're using pack based bounds in order to train neural networks, and since our work is going to talk about giving uh, generalization bounds for the, you know, guaranteeing the risk of the learning classifiers. So another work that is relevant to mention is, is this work uh, of Zugatti and Roy. They demonstrated by optimizing, so they actually uh, trained a probabilistic neural network, so a distribution of weights by optimizing a classical pack-based bound. I'm going to mention a little later on what is that, just exactly what is a classic pack-based bound. And then they experimented on a binary version of MNIST where they, they made two classes. One class is all digits zero to four, they are you know, compacted in one class, and then all digits five to nine, they are to be form, forming another class. And so they made the zero to four versus five to nine, that's a binary, binary version of MNIST, and they experimented there, and they demonstrated that uh, one can get non-vacuous risk bank values, which, is, which was very exciting because it's a hard problem. It had been a hard problem to get non-vacuous risk bound values for neural networks. And uh, so this, this work showed that pack-based bounds can, can achieve that. And at the same time, the training, you know, the test accuracies were not, uh, were, were reasonable. They had reasonable values. So I'm going to move on and I'm going to use the setting of classical neural nets. Again, what I mean by this is uh, the output of the training process is a fixed setting of the neural network weights. And I'm going to use this, this part in order to, to talk about generalities about the statistical learning framework. So what you want to do is from data, you want to do a couple of things. You want to learn, let's call it a weight vector. We're calling it a weight vector, but it's more like a collection of matrices, but you know, like each of the matrices corresponding to a layer of a neural network. But just imagine that all of the matrices have been flattened as a vector and then they have been appended one after the other. And there is, a, there is a very long vector that accounts for all the weights, all the connection weights in the network. So that's the output of training. You know? So from data, you want to be able to find a weight vector. Um, usually it's found by finding you know, one such a weight vector that was well on the training data. But also you want to certify what is going to be the performance of that uh, on unseen data. And uh, a couple of approaches that are typical is one is, of course, you can split the available data, use part of the data in order to train, you know, the network weights, and then use another part of the data in order to evaluate the accuracy of that learned uh, network. But, you know, more like an ideal goal, ambitious goal, maybe like a, a hope we could call it at this time, because I don't think it's, it's been achieved yet is that ideally we would be able to use the whole data, like take advantage of the whole 
available training data in order to achieve both things, like learn, learn a predictor and at the same time certify its performance on uh, examples, instances that are not part of the data on which this predictor was learned. That's what we call like self-certified learning. Again, not saying that this has been achieved, but more like that this is a very much desirable goal. Uh, for a learning framework, so just to like set notation and, uh, and kind of like refresh some terminology, some language. So the, lear the learning algorithm, let's just call it this big ALG, that's a generic algorithm. It takes in data. Data is a finite list of examples in the setting of supervised learning, which is a setting that, that this project uh, was, was uh, in this setting, this project was carried out. So in supervised learning, the examples, each of these examples in this data set is a pair of input and label. And uh, so they come from a set of input, usually a subset of, you know, like finite dimensional space, and then a set of labels. They could be real valued labels if it's a regression problem, a finite set of labels if it's a classification problem. And uh, then there is this weights parameterizing, uh, the, you know, the function that this algorithm may learn. Um, so the algorithm takes in data and then outputs this weight. And then one has to think that this weight maps to some function from a function class. And, and that function corresponding to the learned weight is what actually is going to be used in order to make predictions, like on future examples. You, know, you feed a new input to this predictor, learn from the data, and then that function is going to predict a label for that input. Um, how to measure performance? Uh, a classical measure of performance is empirical risk, which means uh, if, you are, if you fix a loss function, think for instance there are a few choices for the loss function. The typical choice of loss function for classification is the classification loss or the zero one loss. But there are other important loss functions like the square loss for regression, the cross entropy loss for neural network, which is used as a surrogate loss. But once you fix a loss function, then you can look at this quantity called empirical risk, which is some of the losses of a fixed weight over the training examples or over the examples in your data, and then divide by the size, by the number of examples. So that's like, like, that's like the error rate on that data. Um, so this leads to a paradigm for learning, which is called empirical risk minimization. So for the purpose of training, let's say that you have a set of examples for training, let's call it, you know, D-train. And uh, then you calculate the error of a fixed weight on those training examples. So that's empirical loss, it's called the training error. And then the empirical risk minimization paradigm says, we're going to choose a weight that minimizes that empirical risk. Now that, uh, that learning rule has been studied uh, quite a lot. It, it is known to have a couple of, um, a couple of disadvantages. One is being uh, unstable with respect to data. If, you, if your training data happens to change a bit, then this learning rule will produce uh, solutions that, that vary quite a lot. And it also, it tends to overfit. So it leads to poor generalization. Um, so one way to fix that is to introduce a regularization. So instead of choosing a weight vector that minimizes uh, this empirical risk term, you declare a rule that says choose a weight vector that minimizes the sum of that, minimizes the sum of empirical risk and some, regular, some form of regularization. A function could be a norm, could be some other function of the weight. Um, and that introduces some better properties like stability and uh, better generalization as well. Um, talking about generalization, just to describe it in words, what it means is that if we're going to, so one way or another, we have a learning rule that says we're going to choose a weight vector that does well on the training uh, set examples. What we want ultimately is to guarantee that the learned weight will still do well on unseen examples, on examples that were not seen during training. That's what we call generalization. And uh, the specific setting in order to uh, talk about generalization that I'm going to talk about is the statistical learning framework or PAC learning, PAC standing for probably approximately correct. 
So you make assumptions on the data, assumptions that will allow to uh, make connections between what happens or make connections between training data and data that was not part of your training set. So again, you have this finite list of examples. Uh, for supervised learning, they are input label pairs. And then you make assumptions that there is a, a data generating distribution. So the big assumption here is that there is one and the same distribution uh, that is generating each of these uh, examples in the, in the training set. Actually, any of those examples, not just those on the training set. Um, that distribution is unknown. The only way we can gain some information, we can, so we have like indirect access to that distribution via the training set. And uh, we make the assumption that these are independent and like, identically distributed. That's what's going to be able to, that's why going to make it possible to connect uh, what happens in the training data to what will happen on data beyond the training set. And then there is this ideal measure of performance called population risk or like the loss of a weight vector, which is the expected loss with respect to any uh, uh, example for its Z chosen from that data generating distribution. Here outside of the box is written as an integral to make it clear this is, this is expectation with respect to the Z while the weight vector, while the W is fixed in this quantity. So that's the ideal quantity. The problem with it is that it is an unobservable quantity. We don't have direct access to it because the data generating distribution is unknown. Um, so a couple of things that one can do in order to certify performance is uh, of course one can look at the test set error, but test set error, that means so we have obtained a weight vector, we are calling it W hat, based on a training set. Now we have a separate set of uh, examples, let's call it the test set. And we're going to evaluate the empirical risk on that set. Um, that's again, just like the sum of losses divided by the number of examples in that test set. And, uh, and we're going to use that measure. So the empirical risk of the learned weight vector on that test set, we're going to use it as an estimate, as a single number point estimate of the unknown loss of this learned weight vector. But the point is the true loss remains an unknown quantity. I mean, if you think about the possibility of having access to many, like indefinitely many different test set errors, then first of all, this estimate is going to vary from, from test set, from one test set to another test set. And, uh, and, uh, and it's going to be a random quantity that depends on the fixed test set. So each of those, is still tied to having access to a finite list of examples. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that the true loss is something that remains unknown. The only hope that we have about it is to maybe be able to like uh, enclose it in an interval, to bound it somehow. And that's the idea behind uh, certifying performance via confidence bounds. So if we have something like what we call a risk upper bound in statistical learning is for a given parameter, think of a small probability parameter. So one minus that is what we call a large probability parameter. And these bounds say that with large probability over the choice of a random data set, uh, typically those bounds are uniform. They say simultaneously for all weights, you have like the true loss of the weight is upper bounded by the empirical loss of the weight plus some small error term that depends on the number of examples and the confidence parameter. And then one can use that. And instead of any of those weights, plug in the actual W hat output by your algorithm on the training set, just plug it in there. And then you have a guarantee, like an upper bound on, on the true loss of that learned weight vector. Uh, what to kind of advertise here that it is, it is a recommendable practice to report uh, not just your single number, not just your test error, but also a confidence bound um, for the true error based on that point estimate. And uh, one can also do another thing. I mean, this could be applying this risk bound to get a confidence bound on the true loss of the learned weight vector. And, but the weight ve vector here could come from any learning algorithm, you know, empirical risk minimization, regularized empirical risk minimization, whatnot. Another idea is uh, you could use the upper bound itself to build a learning rule and you can declare, okay, I'm going to find a weight vector from data, W hat, that minimizes the upper bound. 
on the true laws. And that has a few interesting properties. For instance, you know, oh, first of all, you can compare it to empirical, to regularize empirical risk minimization since you have a sum of the empirical risk term and some other term that can be seen as a regularization parameter, as a regularization term or a term that um, controls the complexity. Um, what's interesting about this kind of learning rule is that the weight vector that you found, the weight vector that you find comes certified, comes with its own risk certificate. Because once you find it, then you plug that weight vector here, then the loss of that weight vector will be upper bounded by, by the function that you minimize. And uh, of course, that will be useful if, if the risk bound is, first of all, non vacuous, ideally, if it is tight. So if like, uh, if like uh, the values of this bound that come out of that learning process are not so far from the value of the unknown um, true laws. And uh, another couple of good ideas about this, this approach is that it may avoid the need for data splitting because you know, the output of this learning process comes with its own risk certificate. You wouldn't need to calculate a test error provided that the bounds are non-vacuous and tight. So this may need to uh, self-certified learning. Uh, good, I guess this is a good point to stop and quickly ask if there are any questions from the audience. I'm not hearing any questions, so I'm going to um, move on. If you do have any questions, just uh, just um, maybe you can take note of the slide number where you see something that you would like to ask about. And then at the end of the talk, I'm going to spare some time uh, for questions and discussion. So by all means, feel free to do that. So the previous part was about the classical setting. The output of the learning process is uh, a fixed setting of the network weights. So in what comes next, I'm going to talk about the setting in which the output of the learning process is a probability distribution over network weights, a data dependent probability distributions. So I'm going to use that part to talk about both about learning a probability distribution over linear network nets and talking about fact-based bounds. So first of all, talking about randomized weights. So the idea here is again that based on the data, uh, the goal of the learning process is to uh, find a data dependent distribution over weights. So that distribution is going to be the output of the algorithm on the training set. And uh, there are different ways in which one can devise prediction schemes based on a distribution of the weights. The one that uh, I want to emphasize here is the one called stochastic predictions, where for each new prediction that you need to make, you randomly draw weights from that learned distribution and then predict label according to that chosen weight. If you need to make a new prediction after that, then you freshly sample the new weight from the same data dependent distribution that was learned on the training process, and then use that random sample weight to make a prediction and so on and so forth. Um, and then the risk measures that before were called like, you know, the loss of a fixed weight and the empirical loss of a fixed weight, then they are lifted to these uh, stochastic predictors by averaging with respect to a probability distribution. So I'm using also this slide to introduce some notation. This, so Q is a distribution over weights here. And this Q brackets and a function enclosed in the brackets, what it means is that the Q average of the function enclosed in the square brackets. That's what this integral on the right-hand side uh, says. So integral of you know, the loss, which is a function of the weights with respect to this distribution over weights. And similarly, Q bracket empirical loss would mean you know, the average, so the integral of that with respect to this distribution Q. Um, a, a very commonly used notation in machine learning is this one, where you have the expectation sign and as a subscript indicating over what variable you're taking expectation. So in case you are more comfortable with that notation, feel free to think uh, of that notation. But I, I kind of like this notation, you know, Q square bracket function, because it's a very short notation for like, you know, what function is being averaged and what is the distribution uh, over which that function is being averaged. So I hope, I hope you just bear with me like, using that notation for the remaining of this talk 
Um, here are two usual pack-based bounds. Uh, the classical pack-based bounds, so that's the bound that I was mentioning at the beginning of my talk that Zugatti and Roy uh, minimized in their experiments. Um, uh, so here is the average true loss. This is the left-hand side term, and the upper bound on that average true loss is the average empirical loss plus, you know, a square root of a term that involves the KL divergence between that same distribution over which we're averaging, that Q, and oh, here shows up another distribution, Q naught. That Q naught is a distribution that was fixed, um, that was fixed at the beginning. So that's a fixed reference distribution. Uh, also, these bounds have a number of things, like n here is the number of examples uh, uh, used where where you are evaluating this bound. This delta parameter here is the confidence parameter, and then these bounds you should read them as saying that with high probability of a random samples of this fixed size. And then simultaneously for any distribution Q, that's the distribution Q that we're using as a randomized classifier. So this bound holds. I'm presenting this bound, the, the pack-based classic bound, and at the bottom is also the so-called pack-based little KL bound. The little KL bound stands for the binary KL divergence. That's the expression on the left-hand side, the binary KL divergence between the average empirical loss and the average true loss. So think of you know the binary KL divergence as a KL between two Bernoulli parameters. One is the empirical Bernoulli parameter found from the sample, and the other one is like the true probability of success uh, uh, parameter that that we just don't know it, but we are trying to uh, infer something about it. And uh, one more thing to mention. So these are two well-known uh, pack-based bounds. By the way, uh, the bottom pack-based bounds, the pack-based KL bound, is stronger. Uh, it implies the pack-based classic bound by, by means of some other known inequality called Kinsker inequality. Ask me about that anytime. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to mention is that in the pack-based literature, it has become common to, to name these, these two distributions involved here, this Q distribution and this Q nut. So the Q distribution is a distribution, think of it, that's what we want the distribution output from data to be. While the Q naught is a fixed distribution, it was fixed before the training process. So because of this idea, and, and, and because of the analogy with similar distributions found in the Bayesian learning framework, uh, typically the Q distribution is called a posterior in the pack based framework, and the Q naught distribution is called a prior. That's language that was borrowed from the Bayesian learning, um, from the Bayesian learning approach. Although there are some differences about what distributions are in pack base and what the corresponding distributions are in Bayesian learning. If there is time, I'm going to say a few words about those differences at the end of my talk. Um, so those are two usual pack base bounds. Uh, here are two additional pack base bounds. At the bottom of the page is the pack base lambda bound. That was a previously known pack base bound, that the pack base bounds of Tiemann and co authors. That uh, one of the papers that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that was like there at the kind of like the motivating uh, words before this project started. And the other bound is this pack base quadratic bound. Uh, we derive this bound along the way. There is part of the derivation of the derivation of the pack base quadratic bound shares something with the derivation of the pack base lambda bound. So in that sense, is how this work also influences our work. But, but in the end, this pack base lambda bound seems to be a little bit tighter because, well, it uses less less inequalities on the way of uh, on the way of deriving the bounds. So at least in principle, it had the hopes of being a tighter bound. In fact, both can be proved, both the pack-based quad and the pack-based lambda can be proved analytically to be tighter bounds than the pack-based classic. And uh, so in that sense, they seem to be like uh, good candidates for deriving training objectives from them in order to experiment with. Um, and then the rest of the project, so that the big part of the project was actually to explore uh, the properties of uh, like deriving training objectives from these uh, pack-based bounds. Um, a few words about what's common about all the pack-based bounds. Uh, they all, in the end, so th if you see the pack-based literature, you would see bounds that take different specific forms. That's because they use different functions at some point, but they all share something in common. 
like behind all those bounds, there is this uh, inequality that can be traced back to Donsk and Baradam or Chisar. I guess it depends on the way the inequality is written. So one can write the KL between two distributions over the same space. In this case, that space is called W. Think for neural networks as the weight space. So we have two distributions on that uh, space of weights, and the KL between them is equal, exactly equal to the supremum over all functions from that weight space to the real. So like the average of the function with respect to the distribution Q appearing as the first argument of the KL. And then this other term minus this other term, that's, that's an, an exponential moment term of the same function, but with respect to the prior or, you know, to the Q naught distribution. Um, and then the idea in deriving fact based bounds is to extend these two functions that don't depend just on the weights but depend on data as well. And then, so in the variational characterization of the KL, so the Donsker and Paradan equality, so this is the KL is exactly equal to the supremo. But if you fix one special function, then you will get KL greater than or equal to the expression for that fixed function. So that's what's happening, you know, in this inequality. And then you have, you know, the Q average of the chosen function, average with respect to the weights, and then you have the KL and then the exponential moment term with respect to the fixed distribution Q naught. And then if you apply Markov's inequality to this random variable, uh, random in the sense that it depends on data. So this integration is with respect to weights, but data is still random. So if you apply Markov inequality with respect to, to that random variable with respect to data, then you get this high probability inequality that says, you know, this high probability of a random draw of data of size n, then you have this, this um, similar inequality to the one above, but with one extra term. This log one over delta controls, you know, the, the dependence on the confidence parameter. And the exponential moment now is not just over the q naught distribution, but also over the data generating distribution. And uh, so from there, in order to derive specific path-based bounds, what you do is you choose a suitable function F to use, a convenient function that is, has some properties. The main concern, for instance, would be how to explicitly evaluate this exponential moment term. So typically what, what is done in the literature is, you know, you, you choose a function for which this exponential moment term can be controlled in a good way, and then you're done. You have, you know, so this is like a general recipe for deriving pack base, uh, for deriving pack base bounds. Again, a specific pack base bound would amount to choosing a specific function to use in this inequality. I've started to get some rain here. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. If the audio becomes a problem, let me know. I can move location and then get to somewhere that is a little bit affected, less affected by the rain. So that's about pack-based bounds. Here are two typical uses of a pack-based bound. Once you know a pack-based bound, you could either, for instance, have an algorithm that finds a data distribution, a data dependent distribution of the weights. Uh, in some way, you know, you can some rule that gives you a probability distribution of the weight, and then you can use a pack based bound in order to certify the risk of the learned, you know, randomizing distribution. Or, as in the example that I discussed at the beginning, uh, you can use the bound minimizing approach. So you can declare a learning rule by saying, I'm going to find a distribution that minimizes the upper bound, that minimizes the pack based bound. And uh, here both approaches are illustrated with the pack based classic bound, but the same can be done with either the pack based quadratic bound or the pack based lambda bound or with, on, with any other pack based bound for that, for that matter. So if you, if you think of the three pack based bounds that I mentioned, the classic pack based bound, the quadratic pack based bound, and the pack based lambda bound, any of those leads to a training objective that can be used for training neural networks. So in this slide is more or less what those training objectives look like. Um, the KEL terms, they are part of the pack-based bound, so they become immediately like part of the function that is going to be optimized. 
maybe a comment on the empirical term is that here, this empirical loss is not with respect to the classification loss, although we are treating, you know, a neural network classification problem, but we use a surrogate loss for learning. The typical surrogate loss is the percent of this loss. And one extra, one extra comment is that these fact-based bounds uh, require the loss function to be bounded. The cross entropy loss is typically not bounded, so one has to do an extra thing on the cross entropy loss, flip it to make it a bounded loss. Typically, that is enforced by uh, enforcing a minimum, a minimum threshold, positive threshold on the probabilities output by the network. Um, so those are the training objectives that we experimented with. And uh, let me move on to tell you what happened uh, in the experiments, what we saw in the experiments. So the algorithm that we experimented with, we chose the name, we kind of borrowed the name, we called it fact based with backdrop. Hold on a moment, we see. Moving to a quieter location. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. yes it Thanks. So I was saying, uh, this is like a, the schematic description of the algorithm and what it does. So we parameterize distributions, both prior and posterior distributions uh, as Gaussian distributions. And uh, so uh, imagine that in order to actually produce those distributions, you're going to use the, the reparametrization trick. So uh, what is easy to, uh, to compute or to obtain you know, numerically is standard Gaussian distributions. And then in order to obtain Gaussian distributions with you know, a different center than zero and a different variance parameter than, than than, than one, uh, then you're going to just uh, rescale and recenter. And then you're going to use those parameters, the scale and center parameters, as the parameters that are updated by the algorithm. Uh, so these mu zero and rho zero, those are the center and scale parameters of the prior. And then there will be uh, corresponding mu and rho scale parameters that are going to be learned. And uh, you have your data, you know, a finite list of training examples. That is what the algorithm takes in. And then what you're going to do is uh, optimize. In this case, we have, we have illustrated the use of this algorithm with the, you know, training objective called F quad, that's the one derived from the pack based quadratic bound. Um, and you apply stochastic gradient descent. So you update, you, you optimize this, this, this training objective with stochastic gradient descent. And uh, what is good about that? Well, we actually, uh, we actually, so we had kind of like the intuition that this would lead uh, to good results, you know, because we had the previous results of Zubati and Roy that said that uh, optimizing a distribution over weights based on the classic pack based bounds uh, lead to non vacuous risk bound values. They had reasonable test accuracies. One of the things that we were uh, uh, that we were like looking forward to see is that we get even better values of the risk bound, so tighter risk bound values, because the training objective F quad is based on the pack based quadratic bound, which is tighter than the classic bound. And uh, another thing that we were looking forward to is okay, what is going to be the the test accuracy of the of the of the randomized classifier learned based on this. On this training objective. Um, so I'm going to tell you about a couple of a couple of um, a couple of settings, a couple of choices of the prior distribution uh, uh, that we experimented with, and I'm going to only talk about like a, you know a, a kind of simple setting uh, where we experimented with MNIST, like full ten class uh, MNIST. Um, more recently, we have results with other data sets as well, but uh, like today I'm going to restrict um, just to get an impression of what, what the results gave when using the pack-based quadratic bound uh, for training probabilistic neural networks. 
So the prior is a Gaussian distribution. Uh, it is centered at the randomly initialized weights. Um, that's an idea that Zugatti and Roy used also in their 2017 paper. And, uh, and uh, it has a scale parameter that is considered a hyperparameter. So that parameter is tuned before, before training. And then uh, you fix that prior distribution. And then you, you're going to learn a posterior distribution. Call it QD because it depends on data, which is Gaussian. And uh, it has its own uh, mean, the, the weight vector W, and it has its own variance. And those are learned by pack base with back prop by the algorithm that I just described in the previous slide. Um, and then what happened with that? So just for quick comparison, um, training with F quad, F quadratic, gave us um, test errors of about 0.13, about 0.14. So that corresponds to a test accuracy of like a little over 86%. But what was uh, um, important to see was, you know, the value of the risk bound. So this is the, the theoretical guarantee. So the test error is like 13%. The theoretical guarantee on what the test error is, on what, you know, the error analysis examples is, is like 24%. So this is comparable with, uh, more or less comparable with the results that Zugatti and Roy obtained back in 2017. For reference, we re-implemented the same training objective that they experimented with. This is F classic. That's the same training objective that they used in their 2017 paper. The values reported here are not the values that they reported, that they the values obtained with our implementation of that uh, training objective. So the test error comes out to about a little over 15%, closer to 16%. That's more or less like the test error that uh, uh, that they obtained a little bit better. I think they obtained like a 17% 7, test error. The risk bound value, uh, about 24%, uh, comparable to the value that, that they obtained as well. But one other difference to mention is that we experimented with full MNIST, with full multi-class, while the experiments that Zugatti and Roy carried out in 2017 were on this binary version where they crunched together a number of classes against another number of classes. and. Uh, and uh, whatnot. So that was interesting to see. On full MNIST, we, with F quad, we achieve comparable results, a little bit better than F classic, you know, of comparable, of comparable order still. And then another idea was, uh, what if we uh, split the data and use a little bit of the data in order to train a prior, and, uh, and then the rest of the data in order to learn the posterior distribution? Um, so that's, that's what we did in, in the second kind of setting, a prior mean learned from data. So the prior is a Gaussian distribution. Um, the center of that prior distribution is learned by plain vanilla, like empirical risk minimization. So stochastic gradient descent uh, to minimize empirical cross-entropy loss. And, uh, and the posterior is a Gaussian distribution, which is then learned by pack based with back prop. So by, by updating, you know, scale and center parameters uh, at each gradient step, um, at each gradient update step. And what we obtained from that process looks like this. Again, this is full MNIST. Our new training objective, F quadratic, gave, so this was like the exciting news. Test errors of like 2%, so test accuracies of close to 98%. Um, Okay, that has been obtained before, like with the, with, the, with the training objective that Zugatti and Roy used. So with the training objective derived from the pack based classic bound, you also get, you know, high test uh, accuracies, like, you know, 97, close to 98. Uh, and, and test, er so that's the test error is still like around 2%. But the exciting part was the risk bound values that we observed. So the risk bound values that we obtained were closer so we have a test error of 2%. The risk certificate that we produce, the certificate that says, okay, what is, you know, like your error is never going to exceed this value on any unseen example, we get a 4.5%, more or less, uh, with F quad. And with F classic, we get to a, like a 6% uh, theoretical guarantee 
on, on a test error that is calculated like 3% uh, on a test, on a test set. Again, so F classic is the same training objective that was used by Zugatti and Roy, but the numbers reported here are the output of our implementation of that same training objective. And uh, there are a couple of things that I want to point out that are uh, different from what Zugatti and Roy did. Zugatti and Roy 2018 is a sequel paper to their 2017 paper where they experimented with learning priors from data. So that's why this paper is uh, relevant to compare with since we're learning a prior from data as well. However, the difference is that we learn the prior mean by minimizing the empirical cross entropy loss with plain classical vanilla stochastic gradient descent. While Zugatti and Roy used uh, stochastic gradient and Japan dynamics and, uh, and, and then used an argument based on like differential privacy in order to say that, to say that uh, um, the mean learned by SGLD uh, satisfies a differential privacy property and then when that happens, the pack base bound can be adapted, corrected by a little term. And then you can derive a training objective from there in order to justify that you learn the prior from data and then train a posterior by minimizing the bound using the same, using the same data. So we did something different than that. In a way it is simpler since we're using plain uh, vanilla SGD and we are not modifying the, the bound therefore uh, um, and we use a split of the data. So the data that went into training the prior and the data that went into training the posterior, they are disjoint, they are separate from each other. And one other thing to observe is that our implementation of the classic, so our implementation of their training, of their training objective gave, gave values of the risk upper bound that were uh, tighter, so closer to the test error estimate than the values that they reported. I think the best values that they reported were in between like 17 to 21%. Um, so there seems to be something about, so it's not just the training objective that is bringing in some improvements, but it seems that there is also something about the training procedure that gives improvements since we're getting a little tighter uh, risk bound values. So, uh, I mean, after these were like the experimental results from back in April, I think uh, we have some more results uh, in different settings with MNIST, like by using different splits of the data for priors and posteriors and whatnot, uh, experimenting with like, what is the minimal amount of data that one can use in order to train a prior and see the well and whatnot. And also we experimented with other data sets, like the natural step up from MNIST was CIFAR 10. And uh, we hope to get our hands on like more uh, real world kind of data sets. I guess the next, the next after, after we have some interesting results on CIFAR 10, we would like to see what happens in ImageNet as well. That would be interesting to see. Um, I guess the interesting message here is how the training probabilistic neural networks by minimizing pack based bounds uh, leads to these two properties. So obtaining a predictor uh, from the data and at the same time a certificate on the performance of that predictor like on any unseen data. And those certificates are, are giving tight values that they seem to, they seem to bring in some hope that, that this could in principle like eventually lead to something close to self-certified learning. Um, what do I want to say as closing remarks? Um, there is still a lot to do. Um, some of the closing remarks that I want to mention, right. Uh, I want to say uh, a few words about the comparison between pack-based learning and Bayesian learning. So in Bayesian learning, um, probably a lot of you know more than me about Bayesian learning. So I'm just trying to, I'm making an effort to like summarize it in one slide. I'm not trying to like minimize this learning framework. It's very important, it has contributed a lot to machine learning, but I'm just giving like the, the essential, like the snapshot kind of you know, representation of what happens. So you have a prior distribution, in this case over weights. Let me represent this in, in the setting of like learning weights for neural networks. And then uh, the, the Bayesian posterior is a data dependent distribution. So let me use still this notation like QD, D representing the data. 
it has its own density. Let's put the prior also in terms of its own density so that we can write things pretty much in the way that they that we see them written in, in Bayesian learning literature. So the way one gets the posterior is by updating the prior distribution via a factor, a data dependent factor that is called the likelihood uh, factor. And, and then of course, to, to make this a probability distribution, one has to divide you know, this product by a normalizing constant. It's basically the integral of this, uh, of this product. So what's good about this approach, um, there must be many, many good things about this approach that, that I'm, I'm not uh, mentioning here, but again, this is just a quick summary. So what I want to say is that, uh, well, I already mentioned, like the important part here is how there is a strict way in which one, in which one obtains the data dependent distribution, the posterior distribution based on the prior, and it's via this likelihood factor. So there is this update rule, and, and there is a strict relation between you know, prior and posterior in the Bayesian framework. Uh, one thing that I want to highlight, highlight is that this leads to a principled approach to learning. Uh, for instance, think of maximum or posterior learning. The, the, the approach of like empirical risk minimization or regularized empirical risk minimization, uh, uh, especially, um, can be framed in Bayesian learning and approach like in a more principled way. Um, the likelihood factor, once you assume something about your data and generating distribution, for instance, that comes from an exponential family, then your likelihood factor will take an exponential form. And then when you use priors, Bayesian priors of a specific form, then you get regularization terms uh, that correspond to that. For instance, if you use Gaussian priors, that corresponds to uh, weight decay or regularizing you know, the Euclidean norm of weights. If you use uh, Laplace priors, then, then, then you, that corresponds to regularization with the L1 norm. That's a typically used norm in problems that, that involve uh, uh, sparsity. Like if you have some reason to assume that that there is sparsity in the weights of the network, then that might be a better regularization to use than, than, uh, than Euclidean norm regularization. But so the point is that via the Bayesian learning approach, you recover those uh, regularized empirical risk uh, approaches, but with a learning framework that, that tells you just, just what's going on. So that's why, what I like to rescue about this. And to highlight, also, this, uh, the training objectives that, that are derived from these approaches balance a fitness to data term, that's the empirical loss term, and the fitness to, to prior term. Um, good. Contrast that to just a quick snapshot of, of you know, an attempt to, to make the Bayesian approach to learning a little bit more general or to introduce a more flexibility in you know like what kind of distributions you can get posterior distributions based on a prior and an update factor so uh, like a very initial attempt was to um, introduce this extra parameter called a temperature parameter it's actually an inverse temperature uh, if one was to talk about like uh, statistical mechanics this, this would be an inverse temperature but let's call it a temperature parameter it's an exponent on the likelihood term uh, and, and that, that kind of like balances the, you know, the, the dependence of the posterior, like the strength of the dependence of the posterior on the prior or on the, on the, on the, you know, on the data dependent term. And then there is an even more general approach that, that says, okay, uh, maybe if we care about, uh, about obtaining rules that give good predictions, and we don't care too much about like how principled the approach to, to, to obtaining those rules is, then let's replace this likelihood uh, update factor with just some data dependent function, data dependent, weight dependent function, and then form, uh, in this case, they may not be distributions anymore, but form measures over weights uh, that are formed from a prior over weights and updated by that factor. And uh, that's, that's what is called like uh, general, general base. Here is, here is a, an interesting reference. Um, this is pretty much what I, what I, what I read about, about this approach called generalized base. So in pack base, what one does is one forgets about the update factor. And what talks about this fixed distribution Q naught and then this data dependent distribution that is going to, you know, like 
be obtained by the terrain process, but there is no update factor. There is no factor restricting the relationship between these two distributions. So in that sense, you know, one could say pack base is even a little bit more general than, than generalized based as presented in the previous slide. So, I mean, okay, it's not to minimize the, the generalized based approach, but the point is that pack base has a lot more flexibility in the choice of distributions. And, uh, and but the common thing is that they still do balance this, this kind of terms, uh, an empirical data dependent term, like the empirical, you know, the average empirical loss. And then a prior, a fitness to prior term that's a measure via the KL distribution, the KL divergence from the posterior to the prior. Um, so what's next for future directions? Uh, we have explored Gaussian distributions. Why? Well, because a lot of things are known analytically for Gaussian distributions, but uh, maybe it's worth to think about what other distributions uh, would make sense for neural networks. Understanding the properties of the, of the predictors uh, learned by minimizing pack-based bounds with specific distributions. Uh, that's also an interesting direction to think about. I already mentioned that scaling to larger problems, larger, larger, like for instance, more complicated problems or larger dimensionality of the input kinds of problems. Thinking about uh, interplay between network architecture and pack-based bounds. Is there anything there that can be exploited in order to decide what's a suitable distribution to use in the pack-based bounds? Using problem-specific pack-based bounds. There are plenty of directions to think to think about. There is plenty left. Uh, to do research involving, even involving just pack-based bounds for training neural networks, even just there, there is a lot to do. All right, thank you.